sometimes your harshest critics can hold up the mirror to your biggest blind spots. Even those who hate you might have some useful criticism that you can use to grow from. In recent decades, the atheist movement has shifted from the defensive to the offensive in its attack on religion. Their motives may be varied. Some are truth seekers, others have a personal vendetta, and their arguments too range from unhinged rants to serious rational questions. But there is one area that it might be worth listening to even for believers, not so that they will become less religious, but because anyone who's serious about their own worldview should welcome honest criticism. It's the topic of faith. At the very beginning of the argument of those who say that faith is something worth having instead of what I maintain it to be, the surrender of the only thing, our curiosity, our irony, our skepticism, our willingness to inquire, our willingness to doubt ourselves, our willingness to come to conclusions that are not welcome to us. That's the late Christopher Hitchens, one of the most famous atheists of the past century. The topic of blind faith or irrational belief in God comes up often in his talks and writings. As Hitchens writes in his book, God is not great. Faith is the surrender of the mind. It's the surrender of reason. It's the surrender of the only thing that makes us different from other mammals. Amongst believers, blind faith is actually seen as a point of pride in their commitment to God. When you can see it, it doesn't take much faith. The test comes when you can't see any sign of what you're believing for. But it raises a very serious theological question. Blind faith requires you to accept that a loving, kind God gave humans a brain with the capacity for reason and then told them that the only way to know God is to completely ignore that reason. Maybe I'm being too simplistic. Maybe we're meant to grapple with reason and faith and their contradictory conclusions. But let's call it for what it is. According to this understanding of faith, the brain is leading us astray. The very same faculty of reason that we use to trust in our everyday navigation of life is now the enemy when it comes to knowing God. Something doesn't add up. So are we compelled to accept God in the absence of all rational proof? Or are we simply misunderstanding the term faith itself? What if followers of the Bible were never asked to simply believe in God without good reason to do so? Perhaps by going back to the source, we may find that we've gotten faith completely wrong this whole time. So what does faith actually mean? Here's the Mensch Sense take. Let's start with the basics. The original word for faith in the Hebrew text is emunah. It comes up in various places, such as when God appears to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. And he had faith, emunah, in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Or when God splits the sea for the Jews as they are leaving Egypt in Exodus chapter 15. The people revered God and they had faith in God, emunah. Now here's the problem. In these examples, as well as almost every other case in the Hebrew Bible, the word emunah simply cannot mean blind faith. It just makes no sense in the context. Take the case of Abraham. God appears to him in a clear prophecy, a direct encounter, and promises Abraham that his children will enter the promised land. Then after that encounter, Abraham believes in God. If that means that Abraham thought something was true without any evidence, then the story makes no sense. I ask you, what leap of faith is required of you if you've just witnessed the divine? If you had a crystal clear prophetic experience, would that then be called blind belief in God? The same thing is true with the splitting of the sea. The Jewish people are said to have faith in God immediately after witnessing the most insane miracle ever performed. How is that blind faith? The answer is simply that emunah does not mean blind faith. So what then does it mean? According to the Jewish tradition, there are two levels to the answer. The first is straightforward and relatively easy to understand. The second one may require us to redefine how we know anything at all. It sounds complicated, but we'll get there slowly. Let's start with a simpler answer. This definition of Amuna has been discussed for thousands of years by rabbinic commentaries. The contemporary theologian Rabbi Akiva Tatz puts it very succinctly. The word Amuna should be translated not as faith, but as faithfulness. It doesn't mean faith, it means loyalty. Amuna means Neeman, to be loyal. It means to know something and then be loyal to the knowledge. Amuna is what happens after a person knows through reason that there is a God. 
We find many examples where humans know something to be true intellectually, but are unable to make it emotionally real. This leaves them unable to align their behavior with their knowledge. A dieter binges on a pint of ice cream. A university student parties the night before an important exam. A parent stares at his screen instead of interacting with his child. These lapses are not caused by a lack of knowledge about what is important. They're caused by an inability to keep that knowledge relevant in the moment. Emuna is about remaining faithful to what we already know to be true. Abraham has a vision of God, who then makes a promise to Abraham about his descendants. In this moment, Abraham remains faithful to that crystal clear vision that he has experienced and trusts that the promise will come true. I think this is what Jordan Peterson means when asked the question, do you believe in God? His answer famously is, I act as if God exists. He's correct in identifying that real faith is not about possessing a truth statement. It's about how we act in accordance with that truth statement. This makes faith much more palatable. Unlike Christopher Hitchens' version of faith, it does not negate human reason. Reason is the beginning of the process. Faith is a continuation, taking what's intellectually true and making it come alive in the realm of behavior. Well, that's the first answer. It's neat, it fits, and it's insightful. But the next answer is complicated, deep, and may change how you see the entire world. The second definition of Amuna is that it means to know. The problem is, it doesn't mean knowledge in the way that most of us define it. When we say we know something, it usually means that we know a piece of information, such as two plus two equals four, whales are mammals, or that Paris is the capital of France. Sometimes we use knowing in terms of a skill, like I know how to do basic algebra, I know how to swim, and I know how to speak French. If you go to a school or university, they will mostly teach you the first type of knowledge, information, and a bit of the second type, skills. But there are more ways of knowing, ones that we do not typically associate with the word knowledge. Dr. John Verveke, the cognitive scientist from the University of Toronto, outlines four distinct types of knowing. What the cognitive science has been doing is restoring us, helping us to remember what these other kinds of knowing are. He identifies the first two types of knowing as propositional knowledge, knowing a fact, and procedural knowledge, knowing how to do something. But there are two more beyond that. The third is called perspectival knowing. The next is perspectival knowing. This is knowing what it's like to be. Hmm. So you know what it's like to be you now in your state of mind in this situation. What is it like to be drunk or be dreaming? This perspective or experience is very clearly something you know even if it's very difficult to describe it to someone who hasn't experienced it for themselves. Most educational institutions will not spend time on this type of knowing unless you go to a mindfulness retreat or another place that teaches achieving mindsets or higher states of consciousness. But the fourth type of knowledge is what we want to focus on, and that's what Professor Verveke calls participatory knowing. This is knowing by being. This is the kind of knowing that results from how you and reality have been co-shaped to fit together. You know what it's like to be in relationship with something or someone. Anyone who plays in a jazz band or on a sports team can sense this unique relationship with other people and oneself. This participatory knowing also applies to knowledge of what it's like to be alive at a certain place and time. Someone who knew what it was like to grow up black in 1960s America had an experiential participation with that era. I would argue that this participatory knowing is also the mystical definition of faith or amuna. This connection or attachment is how the Maharal of Prague in the 15th century and the Baal Shem Tov in the 18th century defined faith. And if you think about it, this changes the whole idea of faith. Christopher Hitchens saw faith as the first type of knowing, propositional knowing. This blind faith involves having a belief, a specific piece of information with no rational basis. Our first definition of Amuna as faithfulness would probably fit in either the procedural or perspectival definition of knowing. Faithfulness is somewhere between a behavior and a mindset. It's acting on what we know to be true, something that requires practice and training. But faith as participatory knowing means that faith in God is much more similar to being in love or being in sync with your jazz band. You know it because you're in intimate relationship with it. As the 20th century scholar Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik put it, 
Does the loving bride in the embrace of her beloved ask for proof that he is alive and real? Must the prayerful soul, clinging in passionate love and ecstasy to her beloved, demonstrate that he exists? A lot of people will discredit this as pseudo-knowledge because it can't be verified by any independent source. My response would be that this is more of a failure of the Western definition of knowledge because it only considers verifiable knowledge as true knowledge. But we experience on a daily basis that there is a knowledge that is beyond what I can convey to another person, what I can prove on paper. The deepest knowledge of all, knowing with certainty that I exist, is something that I can never prove to anyone else. And yet it is as clear as day that it's true. Unless you're a philosopher troll who tries to convince people that maybe they're just robots or figments of someone's imagination. For those who want to stick with a safer and satisfying definition of faith, then yes, faith is really faithfulness. Do the work and figure out logically that the likelihood of God's existence is highly probable. Then remain true to that knowledge in every aspect of your life. For those who trust their inner selves and realize that true knowing goes beyond textbooks and logic proofs, then I invite you to tap into a deeper sense of faith, one of experiential connection and relationship. It's that transcendent, participatory relationship that fills our lives with love, connection, and meaning. However you choose to define your faith, don't define it like Christopher Hitchens did. Because blind faith and basing your life on irrational beliefs means that God really wanted us to turn against one of the greatest tools he ever gave us, our minds and the capacity for reason. And that makes mensch sense.